Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Mega Projects. Um, this one is all about the Big Dig, which is this big sort of tunnel thing that they dug underneath Boston. I had never heard of this. The comments on previous videos were literally exploding with Simon do the Big Dig. I was like, really? <laughs> A hole under Boston? That's what you guys want to know about? But okay, so, you know, I serve at your leisure. Here is the Big Dig. If it doesn't do well, it's all your fault. <laughs> No country on earth has embraced the automobile quite like the United States. Road trips along vast open highways in a top-down convertible with wind blowing through your, <laughs> through your hair. Thanks a lot. Has become the stuff of American legends. Yes, this free-spirited sense of abandonment is glorious on the open plains of the West, but not so much sat in gridlock traffic in a city designed well before the automobile. Although I listen to a lot of podcasts after people are in Los Angeles, all I hear them complain about is traffic. <laughs> it's like traffic, traffic, traffic. What took place in Boston between 1992 and 2007 was one of the most significant, costly, and most ambitious redesigns of an urban landscape the country had ever seen. And it was called, as you already know, because it's the title of this video and I've mentioned it like six times already, it was called The Big Dig. The Central Artery Slash Tunnel Project, commonly known as The Big Dig, was a titanic undertaking. Ooh. Would you guys like to have the actual Titanic as a mega project? Let me know in the comments, I could do that. And at its completion, it became the most expensive highway project in the United States. This project of tunnels, bridges, transportation improvements, green spaces, and much, much more was vast. In total, the Big Dig consisted of 118 separate construction projects throughout the city of Boston. But it certainly wasn't smooth sailing. The project was plagued with so many issues it was difficult to keep up. From leaks to accidental deaths, from the substandard quality of some of the work to environmental concerns, the Big Dig dig was an enormous headache. Could say it was a big headache. But on such scale, how could it not be? That's one of the things that always depresses me about these mega projects. It's like, oh yeah, we're gonna build this, but you know, we know people are gonna die. <laughs> Boston, with its storied connection to the past, is perhaps the most European and, dare I say it, old-fashioned city in the United States. I've actually been to Boston. I went there entirely because I really enjoyed the TV show Boss. I was in America anyway. It's not like I flew there to visit Boston. I really like the TV show Boston Legal with um, James Spader and William Shatner. Loved that show. I thought going to Boston would be cool. It was interesting. It's a charming place with quaint cobblestone streets filled with historic red brick houses where history feels that much closer. Yet this idyllic view of Boston that many have is also mixed with the scourge of most large cities. Traffic. By the late 1980s, history had caught up with Boston, or rather, the car had caught up with Boston. The raised expressway that barreled noisily through the center of the city was a hellish experience. The infrastructure was simply unable to keep up with the rapid rise in vehicle numbers that choked parts of the city. As early as the 1930s, city planners had suggested some kind of project to alleviate increasing traffic congestions on the city streets. Like many historic urban areas, the roads had been planned and constructed well before the notion of the automobile. What had been first set out for horse and carts was now asked to funnel modern transportation. Unsurprisingly, like many old cities, it struggled. And boy, if these guys in the 1930s were like, hey, we should build some sort of something to alleviate the traffic, by 2000s, it's going to be pretty bad. <laughs> Initially, an elevated highway was constructed between downtown and the waterfronts, with a late alteration to the project meaning a section of the highway passed instead through Dewey Square Tunnel. This alleviated some of the pressure, but such was the expansion in automobile numbers that even this addition eventually descended into snarl traffic. To give you an idea of numbers, in 1958, approximately 75,000 vehicles used the 1.5 miles, 2.4 kilometer central artery per day. But 
By the 1990s, that number had swelled from 75,000 to 190,000 per day. It wasn't uncommon for it to be badly congested for up to 10 hours a day, and it had a traffic accident rate four times higher than the national average. It was estimated that this was costing the public $500 million per year in lost hours. Dire predictions of traffic jams up to 16 hours per day by 2010 meant that something had to change. If anyone was commuting to Boston, during this time period, which, I mean, enough people watch this channel, someone probably was, comment below, this sounds horrible. What was conceived was ambitious. The major aspect of the plan was essentially move the elevated expressway underground through a tunnel that would follow the same path with an additional tunnel to alleviate the traffic heading to and from Boston Logan Airport. The problem was that even though the I-93 ran north to south, the city was designed in such a way that much of the traffic heading east to west needed to use it also at least partially. But, as I've said, the Big Dig was so much more than just a tunnel. Though the Thomas P. O'Neill Jr. Tunnel would be the focal point of the project, it would also include the Ted Williams Tunnel that extends I-90 under Boston Harbor to Logan International Airport, the Leonard P. Zakin Bunker Hill Memorial Bridge, <laughs> Bunker Hill Memorial. These are the longest names of construction things ever. Over the Charles River and the Rose Kennedy Greenway, which would replace the old raised expressway. But there were countless other smaller projects, mainly involving the expansion or improvement of the public transportation network. This wasn't simply making a few alterations here and there. It was a radical redesign of one of America's most historic cities to better adapt for the 21st century. Planning for the enormous project began in 1982, and it's fair to say obstacles were there from day one. In fact, the work would not begin on the Big Dig for nearly 10 years. The biggest and most immediate problem was money. Initial estimates placed the cost at $2.8 billion, and planners believed that the project would be completed by 1998. Didn't it finish in 2007, guys? Not to give too much of the game away. Both of these estimations turned out to be wildly inaccurate. In 1987, a bill passed through the U.S. Senate to fund the project, and although it was vetoed by President Ronald Reagan on the grounds of cost, the Senate was able to override the veto, and preparation began. And you can bet that Reagan isn't getting a tunnel named after him there. The next major hurdle was how they could construct the tunnel system without causing significant delays to the already inflamed traffic above. Remember, the purpose was to ease traffic, so I'm not sure how feisty Bostonians would feel if they faced nearly 20 years of massive delays? The answer is not well. <laughs> to get around this, some rather ingenious methods were used. The existing raised expressway rested on pylons for support, and it's no surprise to hear that these pylons were located exactly where they would need to build the tunnel. As a consequence, they needed to build an entirely new support system for the expressway before even commencing tunneling. This was done by constructing a 37-meter, 120 feet deep concrete wall using a slurry technique, which is a way of building walls in soft earth conditions, often near water. This was constructed below the expressway, which could now rest on top of it. The area was also home to not only the red and blue lines of the Boston subway, but it also needed to pass under a seven-track railway line leading into South Station. This railway line posed a serious problem, with fear that a tunnel below it could cause the lines to collapse, especially at busy hours with 400,000 commuters and 400 trains passing through every day. This would be the largest tunneling project below existing railway lines anywhere in the world. Initial plans had called for large-scale rerouting of train traffic, but this idea was scrapped, and instead, engineers used specially designed jacks to support the ground and train tracks while excavation work went on beneath them. Then there were the environmental concerns, which were perhaps best encapsulated by the fear that construction work could disturb Boston's rat population underground. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh no, the rats! <laughs> This would force them to the surface. Oh, I see where the problem is. This would force them to the surface where they could presumably take over and slowly eradicate humankind or just become a horrible nuisance. Now, the takeover might just be our imagination, but you never know. It's short. Even before construction began on the big dig, engineers and planners had faced a catalog of issues. Surely, construction itself couldn't be harder. Surely not. 
bit of foreshadowing there. <laughs> Construction finally began on this long, drawn-out project in September 1991, on the first bypass through South Boston. Even after this point, the project was still in flux. The biggest example of this was how to cross the Charles River, with a total of 28 designs being rejected for numerous issues. Environmental activists were eager for a tunnel, but this was just deemed to be too expensive. Save the rats! Eventually, planners decided on a design that would have meant highway ramps as high as 30 meters, 100 feet next to the river. The city of Cambridge, which lies directly across the river, understandably balked at such an eyesore and sued for a change in design, which they won. Christian Men, a Swiss engineer, was given the task of designing a bridge that would span the river. He proposed a cable-stayed bridge, which involved one or more towers and cables that support the bridge itself. The design was accepted and construction began on the 1st of October. October 1997. It's actually a beautiful addition to the Boston skyline. At 436 meters, 1,432 feet in length, it doesn't even make it into the top 50 longest cable stayed bridges in the world, but at 56 meters, 183 feet, it was at the time the widest. It was constructed using 1,820 miles of steel, and just to make sure everything was safe, on the 14th of October 2002, around five months before its opening, 14 elephants borrowed from the Ringling Brothers and Barnum & Bailey Circus, weighing a total of 112,000 pounds, that's 51,000 kilograms, walked across the bridge. Apparently, this was a common thing to do in the 19th century to test new bridges, but it's not one we see very often these days. And this, I'm gonna say, was probably just for fun. Okay, so let's move on from bridges because unsurprisingly, the tunnel systems provided the biggest challenge. The soft earth, mixed with landfills that sometimes date back hundreds of years, provided a real headache to drill through. As a result, much of the tunnel was dug again using the slurry technique, meaning that a small tunnel was dug and then expanded horizontally to minimize the risk. Digging under such a modern metropolis was always going to be tough. During construction, 29 miles of utility lines had to be moved, but that pales in comparison to what was added. 5,000 miles, that's a little over 8,000 kilometers of fiber optic cables, and an astonishing 200,000 miles of copper telephone wiring was also installed beneath Boston during the big dig. I mean, you're digging below the city anyway, you might as well install some fiber optic cables. Why not? In total, 12.2 million cubic meters, 16 million cubic yards of soil was removed during the project. That's enough to fill your average sports stadium to the rim a staggering 16 times. Much of this soil was reused either to fill landfills around New England or to resurface Spectacle Island, which lies in Boston Harbor, with as much as eight feet being dumped in some areas on the island as a way of restoring it from weather damage. In terms of concrete used, it was equally astonishing. The 2.9 million cubic meters used during the project would be enough to build a pavement three feet wide and four inches thick that would stretch from Boston to San Francisco six times. The project was officially completed in 2007. <laughs> Just a few years behind schedule, though by 2001 nearly 70% of work and the largest individual projects had already been finished. Still behind schedule. At its peak, the project employed 5,000 workers, producing about $3 million worth of work every single day. Controversy. Where do we even start? Maybe the rats? Not really. This was a project with a whole host of problems that sprung up either during construction or since completion. Now, it's easy to single out problems on these kinds of projects. I mean, the very nature of their size typically makes them ripe for this, as you have seen on other Mega Projects videos. However, the Big Dig experienced more than its fair share. The Boston Globe reported that during the project, a total of a billion dollars was lost because of design flaws. Holy shit. So let's start with the leaks, of which there were hundreds, if not thousands. As early as 2001, those involved were said to be aware of leaks throughout the tunnels, but the information was not made public until a group of MIT researchers discovered them. Much of the blame was attributed to contractors who had failed to remove gravel and debris before pouring concrete. It was an embarrassing admission, especially with newspapers reporting 700 leaks in a single 1,000-foot, 300-meter length of tunnel. So yeah, it wasn't hundreds of leaks, was it, guys? It was thousands. 
definitely thousands, allegedly. This murky quagmire became even worse when in 2005, Massachusetts police raided the offices of Aggregate Industries, who had provided much of the concrete for the project in the belief that they had knowingly supplied substandard materials. The following year, six employees were arrested and charged with defrauding the United States. In 2007, the case was settled for $50 million, with an additional $500,000 set aside to inspect areas thought to contain the poor quality concrete. While there were obvious flaws, the project had so far escaped any serious incidents, but that changed on July 26, 2006. Concrete paneling, weighing an estimated 24 tons, fell and landed on a car traveling on a two-lane ramp connecting northbound I-93 to eastbound I-90 in South Boston. The impact killed a female passenger and badly injured the driver. A full investigation and safety audit was ordered by Governor Mitt Romney, and it was not until June the following year that all sections of the Big Dig project finally reopened. The cause of the accident was the epoxy glue which had been used to fix the panels. This type of adhesive had been originally designed for shorter lengths of time. Power Fastness, who made the glue, agreed on a settlement that totaled more than $28 million. Another aspect of the project which became quickly infamous were the so-called Jinzu guardrails. These safety rails with squared off edges were eventually blamed for as many as eight deaths involving a passenger being ejected from a vehicle after a crash and hitting these posts. Jinzu was a brand of knives advertised on television during the 70s and 80s, and it was the nickname given to these supposed safety features. So, uh, yeah, safety features again. These were finally removed, but only on the curved sections. After all of that, you're probably wondering whether it was all worth it. That, of course, is going to depend on who you talk to. And I remember seeing the comments and people were like, dude, it was a disaster, or, you know, at least it was a successful big project. Both sides of the fence there. At first glance, the ballooning costs, amateurish mistakes, and incompetence might make it a little difficult to view this as a success, especially the Jinsu knives thing. You know, they seem to kill people. <laughs> Some have argued that the situation has just pushed the traffic jams out to the suburbs, and some others have said that, you know, with climate change and all that, maybe we shouldn't be building more things for cars, but encouraging public transportation. And then there's the final cost. Remember, this was all initially budgeted at $2.8 billion, but its cost in 2007, when construction completed, was in the region of $14.6 billion dollars. However, with interest that is still being paid, it's thought that the final cost will be around $22 billion and won't be fully paid off until 2038. But, ignoring all of that, did it achieve what it was designed to do? Well, mostly yes. The congestion problems in and around central Boston have undoubtedly improved. The area has seen a 12% decrease in carbon monoxide since the completion of the project, and a 62% reduction in vehicle hours of travel on the I-93, from 38,200 hours per day before the project to 14,800 per day after. Now, the goal was always to adapt Boston to the demands of the 21st century, and for better or worse, it has totally done that. The dynamic of the city has completely changed without the noxious raised expressway creeping overhead. The green belt of parks and communal areas has transformed the city and added 27 acres of much-needed open space in the downtown area. The Big Dig, in many ways, has been overshadowed by its problems, but the way it was able to remodel Boston is undeniably impressive. It would take a diehard cynic to say that it hasn't led to improvements. With spiraling numbers in our urban areas, there is an increasing need to address the issue of traffic congestion and pollution in our cities. Whether this is done with better roads or better public transportation remains to be seen. We're quick to demand peace, calm, and beauty in our cities. But as long as our lust for the good old automobile continues to grow, well, we will continue to need projects like the Big Dick. It wasn't easy, it wasn't cheap, and the name mentioned in a Boston bar will likely be met with grumbles. But when our way of life demands so much, what other option do we have? So, this was Mega Projects, the Big Dig. Initially, I thought, I don't know if this is going to be interesting. But it was. I hope you found it interesting as well. Well, you're here at the end, so unless you hate watched this video, you probably did. Please do smash that like button if you enjoyed this video. That would be awesome. Subscribe to Mega Projects. It's a relatively new channel. And thank you for watching.